like a song that would have been written in 1746, does it? As uh, I was really struck this morning as we were watching the, the video downstairs <coughs> the, during Sunday school, and then in some of these songs, with the idea of uh, rejoicing even in troubles, and even more so in troubles. You know, we talk about witnessing as Christians and you know, letting our light shine, and we think about good works and, you know, those types of things and being good people. But where the rubber meets the road is when things aren't going well. When the world is against us, it seems. When nothing works right. This week, some of you have been praying with us on Wednesday night for our tractor out at at the camp. It's been broken down. The steering has been messed up. We've had some leaks in the steering. And we have been working on that since March, April. And we have taken that thing apart and put it back together so many times. Jared's going to about do it in, this, in, his, in the dark now, <clears throat> just because he's done it so many times with me. And there's a frustration. It's like, what in the world? I've done this. I've replaced this. I've done this. It should work. And uh, was it Friday we were working on it? Friday. We uh, got a new part for it, got it put in there. And got it all put back together. It takes hours to do this, by the way. It's, it's complicated. And turn it on, and it worked. No leaks. Yes, we got it. Take a picture. And I did. He even took a video of Jairus using the thing. Finally getting some of these projects done. They're just kind of in the way that we've got day camp going on. There's some hazards there. And so Jairus is out there working, and I'm taking a video. Yes, I can't wait to share this. And it wasn't 10 minutes later, and sure enough, it's bubbling out. Are you kidding me? Again? So what am I going to do in the midst of that? Am I going to curse and swear? That's definitely, you know, I shouldn't say this, but I'm tempted to. ay 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 you know? Those are the times when we say, thank you, Lord. Those, when we face that kind of garbage, that's just dumb stuff, you know? I could give testimony of others in this room are facing way bigger things than that. And just like, what gives? When is this ever going to end, right? We're not talking about persecution here. We're just talking about just the dumb stuff of life. And as Christians, how do we respond in the midst of that? Do we just throw our hands up and say, well, I'm giving up on this? Or do we press on and here we are in church singing, rejoice the Lord is king, right? We haven't become so discouraged that we're saying, I don't think that's even true because, man, nothing goes right ever. If I was just to list all the terrible things that I've had to face in my life or in the last week or the last year or whatever, there's no reason to rejoice except that there's something going on inside me that's different because of Jesus. That's why I can rejoice. Even when that recurring issue just, I can't get that stupid tractor fixed. You know? But I'm going to rejoice because the Lord is still king. And he is working on something in my life apparently because I'm going to have to go back and do that again. Because it's still not fixed. Because the Lord is still working on something in my heart, I'm sure. Because this is not a new thing for me. I've dealt with this all my life. I made the comment, I think it's on Wednesday night, I made the comment, all I ever do is work on junk. It's all I've ever done my entire life, it seems. But God is working on something in my life. What am I going to, how am I going to respond to that? Am I going to rejoice because the Lord is king? Or am I going to throw my arms up and give up? I have no choice but to rejoice, Lord is king, because I could throw my arms up and give up. What good does it do me? I'm still in the same situation. I might as well rejoice because the Lord is king of my life. And one day, he's coming back for me. 
That was all bonus material. Because we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And that has nothing at all to do with the message. <clears throat> We've been looking at the qualifications for how an overseer is to be above reproach. We've spent several weeks on this. And we're actually going to finish it this morning. Some of you may be going, hooray! We're finally getting through these few verses we've been in. We've seen in, in the beginning, is all of this is under the heading of uh, being above reproach. You might call it one of the qualifications, but I think it is the qualification. And then he's describing all the ways this man is to be above reproach. First of all, he lists some things that he is to be. We're not going to go through those this morning. We spent a couple weeks on those. And then he lists some things that this overseer is not to be, which we covered last week. And now those things are just kind of provided as a general statement of fact. And then these final three things that we're going to look at today are given as the standard, and then he adds an explanation as to why they're so important. He doesn't give that with those first ones, but with these, he says, here it is and here's why it is. So he's laid out this general character and behavior of the one who would be an overseer in the church. Having done that with these things he's to be and not to be, now he sees, we see first how this man is to manage his household matters. Verse 4, 1 Timothy 3, says, He must manage his household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. There's the, there's the what, and here's the why. For if someone does not know how to manage his household well, how will he care for God's church? So you see there, there's the, there's the standard and the why. So we start by considering if this man is managing his household well. Now first we find this description of the standard, and we can probably draw some pretty accurate conclusions about what it means to manage a household well. I could probably just say that and move on, but I'm going to preach, right? No, I, I think if we, if, we look at the, if we look at what the language is saying here, it'll help us get a better understanding. So, first of all, manage. Now, the Greek word that's used here has a lengthy definition, and in short, it is to set or place before. So, kind of give it preeminence. That's what the, the Greek means, but then you know, underneath that you see all those other little definitions there. And if we were to look at all of those things that this word means, it gives us a really good picture of how this man is to behave in the home in terms of management. And it's another evidence that the Lord intends this role for a man and not a woman. Throughout the scripture, we find the role of man as a leader of the home. He is the one responsible for the activities described here. Now, a few weeks ago, I guess it was a month ago or so now, but before Mother's Day, as we were going through 1 Timothy, I ended up giving a, what I would call a good Mother's Day message, but it was a couple weeks before Mother's Day actually happened. And so I find myself today delivering a good Father's Day message a week early, so uh, just kind of remember this next week when I'm not preaching a Father's Day message. I already preached it this week. Because this is a good admonition to fathers, generally. But the beauty of what we find in these behaviors is that they're not limited to just fathers, although they are limited, I think, aimed at at least men. Men, as the God-ordained leaders, first in the home and then in society, should develop these patterns in their lives even before marriage and children enter the equation. Men, we must, by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives as Christians, focus on these things as soon as we become aware of the need. And that means if you didn't know about it before, now you're aware of this need and you need to do something about it. This is not just about ruling the roost. Some men misconstrue this and misunderstand the concept of leadership to mean that they are to have an authoritarian rule in the home. The wife has no significant voice in the things, and the children live as robots, afraid of what might happen if they deviate. This is not the picture painted 
by the definition of proistome, which is the Greek word here. That's why the ESV and most modern translations used manage to convey the Greek rather than rule. Because rule has all kinds of connotations that, that we kind of assume. Whereas manage, we have a little different perspective when we use that word. Yes, there is a need for presiding over and being in charge. Is one of the definitions of the Greek of the Greek uses there. Someone has to be the one to take responsibility for things and make decisions, which has an element of ruling. However, that is done from a position of protector or guardian who's concerned about and responsible for caring for those under his leadership. The decisions of this one who proistomes well are not made to serve his own interests. Rather, they're in the best interests of the ones for whom he is responsible. That is a key difference in managing versus ruling. Although you can rule with the best interest of those you're over. But there's kind of this idea sometimes that men get that my wife is here to serve my needs and she's to make me happy. My kids are just, you know, they've, they've got to do what I say. They've got to toe the line because they're here to serve me. And so everything that I do as a husband, as a father, is really about me, which is a complete misunderstanding of what this has. That is not at all what's going on here. But oftentimes men get in that pattern. And I go to a job every day, and I work my tail off every day because I want to have all these toys. I want to go to these nice places. I want to have all these nice things because I am the center of my universe. This is not what Proustume talks about. That is not at all. I go to work. I work a job. I, I work my knuckles to the bone. Why? Because I'm serving my wife and my children. I do all of these things because I'm the provider, because I'm the guardian, because I'm caring for them, because I love them more than myself. That's what this manager, this proistome is doing. It's not to say that he always makes decisions that are right and achieve that in the best possible way. However, there should be no question in anyone's mind that he did so to the best of his ability and with knowledge intending to protect and care for those for whose care he's responsible. This is part of the qualification of the next one, with all dignity. His leadership is from a position of honor and purity, which earns from those he leads reverence and respect. I think, too, there's something to be said for the dignity to be reflected in the position he would hold in the church. It's easy to make more out of this as that's, in, that's, that's intended by the context. But this man should remember the importance of this role and behave with a level of dignity and honor. Now, some take that to far extremes, I think, in, in just elevating the position. But I think there's, there's something to be said for that position of being held in high regard and the man who holds it treating it as such. Truly, though, this is related to how this man manages, this dignity and how he manages. But that's also going to show up in how he presents himself and how he will represent the position of overseer in the church. Next, we consider how he is keeping his children submissive. Now, there's an English word that's often misunderstood, submissive. And even the Greek can be taken to extreme application. Paul used the word in other of his writings, and it can help us have a less negative view of it. In 2 Corinthians 9.13, Paul wrote this, By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. Now, I am doing what I'd never, ever do, and I, I hate doing this, but I'm taking this completely out of its context. I'm not even going to look at where it, what's before it or after it, because all I'm interested in is this word and how this word is used. 
In 2 Corinthians 9.13, we see that our submission to Christ flows from a heart changed, uh, motivated by our love for Him. And so we recognize His love and His care for us, and we submit. This captures the idea behind submission as it's used in 1 Timothy as well. In 1 Timothy 3, this man's children submit to his leadership because they recognize his love and his care for them. They aren't beaten into submission as one nation conquers another. Their heart is toward him because he has demonstrated and proven his love and his care for them, even at times through discipline, much like Christ does for his church. Now, there eventually comes a point in a man's children, in their lives, when they're independent. They're living on their own. The child's relationships, uh, relationship to the parent changes over time. As a baby, the child is completely helpless without the parent. It's interesting as you look around this room and you, you, you realize the different stages we have. We've got Allie here who a few months ago, was a baby completely dependent, couldn't even walk on her own. And now she's, she's getting older, she's getting around, she's becoming less dependent, but she's still dependent on her parents, 100%. And we've got Kieran here who's a little older and he's a little more independent. And we go on up the line to teenagers and eventually young adults. And, and so there comes a point at which as, as we mature as human beings, as we grow up, Naturally, we become independent. Hopefully, we become independent. The context of this speaks to a father who is still actively in the role of managing his children. He is absolutely responsible for the actions of those children, still living under the direct management of his, of, of his leadership. But at some point, the children are released from that management. Now, my dad is no longer responsible for the decisions I make. I am completely accountable for my own decisions. Now, that's not to say that my dad isn't still proud of or at times maybe disappointed in my actions as his son. But his role of managing my life is really finished. Right, Dad? Dad's going, I hope so. Yeah. And that's really evidence that he has completed his task, and he did so well. Now, I still call upon him regularly for advice and direction, even when I'm working on my tractor. (laughs) He has a huge influence in my life. But I have long since moved out from the place of being under the management of his household. Nonetheless, dad still manages his household well, albeit now without children. Now, he did keep his children submissive when we still lived in his household. His influence now is different. And his children do still submit to him in those few things over which he still has authority as it relates to us now as adults. My point is that this directive relates to a man's management of his children when they are children, When his children are no longer under his management, it's a bit trickier to evaluate his effectiveness as a father. But it still must be considered in some way. Now, before we get too caught up in the technicalities of this, Paul gives us then the reason for this standard, which is to ensure that this man knows how to care for the church. Because if he can't care for his children, his family, you don't want him caring for the church. Don't be fooled into thinking that a guy with unruly children that are out of control has the leadership ability that the church needs. Now note too here the language that's used. We go from managing the household well to then caring for God's church. This is instructive as to what's in view with the term manage. This is fatherly care. The pastor's heart for the church should be as, his fa- as a father's heart for his children, which is as God's heart for his children. I am a provider for my children. That's my job. 
I do what I can to ensure their protection, their provision, their maturing. And whereas that role will change as my children grow up, if I do my job right, the need for the pastor to maintain that focus in the church remains constant. It doesn't end. The overseer, the pastor, is always in that role of overseeing and managing the church. God calls men into this position specifically to care for the church. And the man who has neglected a responsibility toward his family should not be trusted to do any better with the church. Conversely, the man serving as a pastor who neglects his responsibility to manage and care for his family because he allows the church to take that attention needs to be reminded that he's misdirected his management skills because it happens all the time. Men, regardless of their intentions to serve as pastor or overseer, must embrace their role as leaders no matter the capacity in which they have opportunity to do so. So it doesn't matter if you're called to be a pastor or overseer. As a man, you are called to be a leader in some capacity. When men fail to lead either by doing nothing or by being bullies, because, by the way, just because you're a bully and you push through and get things done does not mean you're a leader. And when we fail to do that, as men, the world suffers. The world suffers when men fail to do that. And when Christian men fail to do that, the church suffers. There are many suffering churches right now because of either men who don't do anything in terms of leadership or men who are just bullies in the church. Either one will cause damage to the church. And so it must be guarded against. The next qualification relates to the man's maturity in the faith. Verse 6 says, He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. So the standard here is that he's not a new believer. But the question we might ask here is at what point one moves from the category of being a new believer and on to whatever the next step is. Is that weeks, months, years? Sadly, churches are full of many men who have been Christians for decades, who have never bothered to grow in their knowledge and understanding of the Lord through His Word, who might as well be called new believers, because they don't know anything. They're immature in the faith. They could pass the recent convert test. In, I've been a Christian for 40 years. They could pass that, but are every bit as inclined to fail as church leaders because they lack maturity. And thus the Lord gave us the reason for the standard that he may watch out because he may become puffed up with conceit. Now, new believers are especially are often full of passion for, about Jesus, and they often put to shame those who have uh, known him most of their lives. Unfortunately, that passion and the stark contrast with folks saved for much longer can also cause much trouble. They're inclined to become, as the text says, puffed up with conceit. Feeling overconfident in their ability, they see themselves as more capable than they really are. And it's all too easy for churches to put too much confidence in that passion and give a man like this more responsibility than he can really handle. And Paul drives home the seriousness of this problem with a stark warning this man, that this man could ultimately fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, without doing any kind of a deep dive into, the what, into what that means, you're probably going, well, that doesn't sound very good. I sure don't want to be, the, I don't want to get in that trouble, whatever that is. Well, it seems to be a reference to the conceit that trapped the angel Lucifer and led him to his condemnation and fall to become the one we now know as the devil. It's a grave danger 
that the one not well grounded in scripture and prepared for ministry can easily think more highly of himself than he should. A pious, self-righteous, self-righteousness tends to develop when he sees more mature Christians as set in their ways, stuck on tradition, and somehow holding back the church. Like the devil, he's inclined to exalt himself to his own demise. And the church does him no favors that installs a man unprepared for the position of overseer in the church. The conceit into which this novice Christian is likely to fall would be to his demise as much as it would be to the church's demise. I have known more than one man now heavily involved in the satanic deceptions of witchcraft, atheism, or other cultic beliefs who once held a position of spiritual oversight in the church. I've known many. I could name right now three or four or five who are youth pastors who now practice witchcraft. Who are associate pastors who are now atheists. Why? I strongly suspect that they were thrust into that position when they were very immature in their faith. They were charismatic and and go-getters and and they rose to the top and the church quickly installed them and man this guy's this guy is passionate and he needs to be in charge of the youth and look at look at how he works with the kids and 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 look at how he speaks and oh let's put him in that position quick while we've got him here while strike while the iron's hot and now that passion that charisma those leadership skills which likely caused their rapid ascent in the church, have been used to lead many astray. To say nothing of the condition of these men who long ago rejected Christ. So finally, the church must consider the potential overseer's reputation in the community. Verse 7 says, Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And so the standard here, I would say, would be above reproach. We've already seen that in verse 2. That's kind of the overarching uh, characteristic of this, uh, this overseer. But now that moves to how he's above reproach outside the church as well, where the the man should have a good reputation and be highly regarded by those who are not in the church. An ill reputation by those outside the church opens this man up to a separation from believers, falling into disgrace, which leads to then the reason for this standard. The devil, he says here, lays a trap It's a trap or a snare of the devil that will pull this man out of Christian service altogether. And once again, we see that the reason for the standard is less the protection of the church and more the protection of the man who should not be put in this position. And it reiterates the seriousness of this position. It's not to be taken lightly either by the church or by the one desiring it. It's safe to say that the the devil will come after any man in this position to trip him up, regardless of his maturity level. But the immature believer or one uh, open to valid criticism in the community for his poor character and behavior is much more likely to succumb to the pressure and then fall into disgrace. And it will be devastating to this man and to the church. And the church would spare him this destruction by not giving him this responsibility for which he's not prepared. Oftentimes in desperation to fill pulpits, churches may be tempted to compromise on the clearly prescribed qualifications for those who would serve in spiritual oversight of the church. In a culture that believes that men and women are at their core the same and capable of doing the very same things equally well, Many are reinterpreting the teaching that God intends men to hold this position and not women. And when we change that, it changes how we read everything else in this list, as we've seen in these final qualifications. 
Now, th- though this list is, is, the entire list is contained in six short verses, the implication of each qualification is huge. And that's why we spent so long going through these. It's especially true when we consider that this list is provided because the man in this position is to set an example for all in the church to follow as we're conformed to the image of Christ. That is to say, these are some of the particulars of how we are to be like Jesus. We are thus not at liberty to amend these qualifications, no matter how desperate we may be to fill a position or to appease a contingency in the church determined to fit Scripture to culturally popular ideas. These are the words of God, written by Paul's hand, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They are instructions to the church. They're guidelines, they're warnings. If we do not take care in this area, we will, one, destroy the lives of the men we put in these positions, and two, we will ultimately destroy the church. And the church, you look at churches everywhere who have failed in these areas, and you will see the failure of these churches. Good intentions may have been there, But God has given these things because he knows, he knows that this is how these men are to be. And he knows if they they live to these standards, these men will be good leaders. These men will lead his church well. And so we cannot compromise in these things. But as I've said time and time again over the past several weeks as we've been going through this, these are things These are standards to which all of us should be striving because these are the reflections of the image of Jesus. What would Jesus do? Well, read 1 Timothy 3, 2 to 7. That's what Jesus would do. That's how Jesus would live. That's how Jesus did live. And that is how we are to live. And so as we close out our time this morning, as we pray together as a church, if you've not been here before, this is, this is what we do. I don't do an invitation per se, but we pray. Folks in the church will pray. Anyone who's here is welcome to pray, voice a prayer in response to God's word and what he's saying to you this morning. And as we pray, This is the time when I believe the Holy Spirit works powerfully, when His church is praying. And as we pray, if you are here and you're going, man, I don't really know about all this, all this, what's this Christianity stuff? I don't really know. Talk about salvation. You've talked about, I've I've not talked at all about salvation. I've talked to Christians. I've talked to men who are called to lead. You might be saying, well, I don't fit in that category at all. What does this have to do with me? These are the standards at which we are to live as Christians. And if we're not living there, something needs to change. Either we need to come to Christ in the first place, or we need Him to do a work in our lives. And so this morning, as, as folks are praying in this, in this room, every head is going to be bowed and eyes are going to be closed. This is also your opportunity. If you want to come forward, you've got to talk with me. Or if, if uh, there's some women who can come if you want to talk to a woman. But as we're praying, if you want to come forward and, and have a special prayer with me or whatever, that's fine. But I'm going to open us in prayer, and folks are going to be praying, and then I'll eventually close us in prayer. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this church and what you're doing in this church. I thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, as we dig farther into your word, dig more deeply into your word, it's just amazing what you do through that. Though we can read the Bible through many, many times, when we dig into it, as we've done this morning in 1 Timothy 3, we find even more detail and more truth that's there for our lives. 
We thank you for this, this powerful thing you've given us. We thank you for the way your Holy Spirit works through your word. We thank you also for your presence here this morning as we pray, as we study your word, as we have studied your word. But now, Lord, as we, as we respond as a church in prayer, I ask, God, that you would move in a powerful way. Lord, we know that you are fully capable of working regardless of the environment, regardless of the music that may or may not be playing, regardless of the distractions, that you can do something in our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that you would do that now as we pray, as folks respond in prayer, Lord, that you would move in our hearts.
Lord, I thank you for your presence here this morning with us. God, I thank you for Jesus. So much thank you for Jesus. For what he did when he went to that cross, willfully went to that cross, giving himself as a sacrifice for my sin. That his blood would cover my sin, that through faith in that, my sins could be atoned, be covered. And that you would look at me as your son. And give me then the ability to commune with you as we do right now. God, I love you. I thank you so much for, for your love for me, for us. For your blessings on this church, Lord, on the folks who are here this morning. For those who are joining online. God, I pray that you would empower us this week to be witnesses of Jesus as we leave this place. And Lord, as each one deals with our own struggles, our own temptations and trials, some may even face some level of persecution. God, that we would uh, remember who you are and that we would trust you even in the midst of those struggles. Trust that you're doing something in our lives that can only be done through those struggles. God, we thank you for those struggles. We don't like them. We don't want them. We don't look for them. We run from them. But we praise you, God, for the work you do through them. God, give us your eyes towards those struggles. That as we wrestle with different things and perhaps even with different people, that we would see your hand at work in us, conforming us to the image of Christ, even through things that we may not like. God, we know that the witness we have to the world is, is, is really ineffective oftentimes when things are going well for us. The most effective witness we have is when we are facing struggles and still leaning on you and still glorifying you. God, give us that perspective that we will glorify you in the midst of struggles. And I do pray, Lord, for those who are facing struggles right now. There's some who are facing very serious health issues or their lives are even on the line. I pray, Lord, that they would experience your power and your presence in their lives even in the midst of that. Again, Lord, that you would use us to be witnesses of Jesus with those we encounter every day of this week. In his name and for his glory, amen. So now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.